Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this course entitled 20th Century Fiction where we're looking at uh, James Joyce's Ulysses. So we had a lecture uh, talking about the, some of the concerns, some of the style, some of the uh, thematic narratives which inform this particular text and we talked about particularly about how the narrative technique used by Joyce relies a lot on uh, the stream of consciousness technique in the sense that you know it cuts back and across time, it cuts back and, back and across space and we have different characters crisscrossing each other in different narratives. So in a way this becomes uh, uh, quite similar in some sense with uh, to uh, Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf which is what we just finished uh, prior to this. Uh, like Mrs. Dalloway by Woolf, uh, Ulysses 2 is about one day in Dublin, uh, so it is about one day in one city. Uh, different characters crisscrossing each other in that one calendar day. But of course we know that uh, the whole idea of calendar day in modernism is very superficial because it just uh, appears as some kind of a structure, temporal structure, uh, inside which we have different kinds of uh, a psychological time inhabiting. Uh, so people inhabiting different kinds of psychological time, mental time, memory time, uh, you know, uh, psychic time and all these are obviously complicating the one calendar day time which is a superficial uh, temporal frame. Okay, uh, so this is the opening line of Ulysses. Well obviously it is not possible for us to read the entire novel. So like Mrs. Stalloway we will look at certain sections. Um, I mean this is a bigger, a longer and more bulky novel uh, than Mrs. Stalloway. So we will look at certain selected passages in the novel in terms of how that connect, those connect to some of the concerns we talked about in terms of memory, uh, mourning, uh, masculinity, uh, you know the whole idea of gender, the whole idea of femininity in, in, in uh, Ulysses because we will also take a look at some of the characters who are often understudied. For instance, Molly Bloom is a character who is often understudied in Ulysses. So we look at how uh, Molly Bloom's um, uh, dramatic uh, interior monologue with which Ulysses ends, how that actually foregrounds uh, the female body, the female sexuality in a way which is quite subversive in quality. Okay, uh, but this is the beginning of the novel which is in a big uh, uh, tower. Uh, you know, this is the Santa Gove Tower in, in Dublin, uh, close to Dublin. Straightly plump Buck Mulligan uh, came from the stair head, bearing a bowl of lather in which a mirror and a razor lay crossed. A young dressing gown, ungirdled, was sustained gently behind him on the mild morning air. He held the bowl aloft and intoned, uh, in tribulo ad altare die. So again, the, it's Latin for, you know, I give myself to your altar, uh, for youth, for life. Uh, so this is obviously an address to God. So to God's altar, I give myself in, uh, in, in, in hope of youth, in hope of eternal youth, in hope of eternal health. Right, so we have Buck Milligan who comes in here. He's a medical student, and he is uh, someone that you know, co-inhabits the space along with uh, Stephen de Dallas, uh, who is the, uh, one of the more, uh, most central characters in Ulysses, and he's uh, the Telemachus version. So you know, as I just mentioned in the previous lecture, that Ulysses uh, it, it conforms to the epic style, the mythic style, uh, and the mythic or the myth, the original myth of Ulysses is obviously Ulysses, the, the Homeric warrior coming back from a series of wars uh, to his home and Telemachus' son uh, who is now ruling, uh, who is now in, in charge of the island and Penelope, uh, the wife uh, of uh, Ulysses who had been visited by different suitors at different points of time because people had presumed him to be dead. Uh, that's the you know, that's the original myth, the original mythical narrative. Now, obviously, uh, that mythic method is used by Joyce to uh, sometimes to parody, sometimes to conform, and sometimes to depart uh, from the original story. So, for instance, in this story, uh, Penelope uh, Molly Bloom, who happens to be Penelope, the Penelope character, uh, she's not faithful to her husband all the time. So, there are episodes. Uh, for instance, the last one is entirely with Molly Bloom's uh, subversive sexuality or subversive sexual morality, uh, which is a, a dramatic departure from uh, the Penelope figure, the Penelope persona uh, in, in Homer's uh, uh, original epic, original myth. Right, so uh, that mythic method is sustained and, and Stephen did Alice away. Uh, uh, he is the uh, modern version of Telemachus, the son of Leopold Bloom and Leopold Bloom being Ulysses away. Yeah. Okay, so these characters are obviously very loosely structured around the original myth and uh, Joyce obviously is trying to 
rewrite the original myth in modern day Dublin. Uh, and obviously, sometimes there's a degree of deflation, there's a degree of uh, you know uh, parody, there's a degree of uh, departure from the original um, you know the s structure, etc. Okay. Uh, halted, he peered down the dark winding stairs and called out coarsely, "Come up, Kenge! Come up, you fearful Jesuit!" Solemnly, he came forward and mounted the round gun rest. Uh, he faced about and blessed gravely Tricer Tower, the surrounding, uh, this is a Martello Tower in Sandy Clo, by the way, uh, where Ulysses opens. He faced about and blessed gravely Trice, the tower, the surrounding land, and the awaking, uh, awaking, sorry, the awaking mountains. Then catching sight of Stephen Didalus, he bent towards him and uh, made rapid across the inner air, gurgling in his throat and shaking his head. Stephen Didalus, displeased and sleepy, leaned his arms on the top of the staircase and looked coldly at a shaking, gurgling face that blessed him, a quin in his land, and at a, in the light of uh, untonsored hair, grained and hued like pale oak. All right, so Didalus comes up sleepy, Didalus is displeased, uh, Didalus uh, comes up moody. Reckon Buck Mulligan uh, is someone who is in charge, uh, who is an English medical student uh, here in Dublin. Okay, uh, Buck Mulligan peeped an instant under the mirror and then covered the bowl, the bowl smartly. Back to barracks, he said sternly, he added in a preacher's tone, for this old dearly beloved uh, is a genuine Christian, body and soul and blood and ounce. A slow music, please. Shut your eyes, gents. One moment, a little trouble about those white uh, corpuscles. Silence all. So we find that this is obviously, uh, and we, we discussed already how Ulysses was such a scandal uh, to the Catholic Church. And we find at the very beginning uh, of uh, in this novel, we have a medical student who is quoting the scriptures, is quoting the, the holy phrases, the Latin phrases, only to parody the same because he, uh, the Buck Mulligan over here, he doesn't believe uh, in the eternity of the soul, he doesn't believe in uh, you know, uh, the, the holiness and sacrality of the body either. And very soon we'll talk about uh, Stephen's dead mother, you know, that whole idea of uh, you know, uh, the dead mother being unheeded to the time of, his, of her death uh, will come back very quickly. But Buck Milligan's take on the entire thing about death and life is strictly medical in quality. So him quoting um, the scriptures, him quoting the Latin lines, the holy lines, obviously carries a parodic significance, which is something that Ulysses tried to foreground at the very beginning of the novel. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> and then obviously uh, the mockery of Didalus's name comes in, and as some of you will know, that Didalus was the son of Icarus in the original Greek myth. Uh, so Icarus was someone who made this, um, you know, uh, waxen wings to uh, fly away from the, 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 the prison in which he and Dallas were uh, imprisoned. Uh, and the warning, of course, was not to fly too close to the sun. Or the Dallas uh, becomes the, you know, you know, he flies close to the sun, and Icarus obviously tries to rescue him, and so Icarus becomes, uh, and both of them die. So Icarus uh, becomes this, uh, the entire, uh, you know, the, the, the whole myth becomes. Uh, a metaphor of human hubris. Okay, so uh, Didalus and Icarus, they, they, they obviously, uh, the father son relationship, Didalus becomes the archetypal craftsman. And that craftsman quality is interesting because uh, uh, Didalus over here, he wants to be the writer, he wants to be the artist, he wants to be uh, the perfect craftsman in that sense. So he's a modern craftsman, he's a modern maker of waxen wings. Uh, and if you read the portrait artist of a young man, you find that in the same uh, Didalus. Um, uh, persona is projected over here. Uh, so Stephen Didalus obviously is a struggling writer and he is co-inhabiting here uh, this particular house with uh, Buck Mulligan who happens to be a medical student. Okay, uh, he pointed, uh, so, so the, the mockery, I mean his Greek name is Memoctad, the mockery of it, he said gaily, your absurd name, an ancient Greek. He pointed his finger his, in, in friendly jest and went over to the parapet laughing to himself. Stephen Didalus stepped up followed him uh, warily halfway and sat down on the edge of the gun rest, watching him to, uh, still as he propped his uh, mirror on the parapet, dipped the brush in the bowl and lathered cheeks and neck. Now you find that Ulysses is full of this very daily banal bodily activities, you know, these are two people shaving and very soon quickly in the second section we find Leopold Bloom who will be defecating uh, and that too will be described in very graphic detail. So all kinds of bodily functions, obviously sexual functions which are coming later will be foregrounded and described in vivid graphic details which obviously was part of the scandal quotient of this book. Okay. Uh, 
Buck Milligan's uh, gay voice went on. My name is absurd too. Malachi Mulligan, two ducktails. But it has a Hellenic ring, hasn't it? Tripping and sunny like a buck himself. We must go to Athens. Will you come if I can get the aunt to fork out 20 quid? Uh, I know, so the whole idea of going back to Athens becomes interesting because, you know, uh, that becomes, in a sense, uh, going back to Athens is like going back to the center of culture, going back to the center of where it all started from. Uh, the whole idea of Mulligan and the Dallas and Icarus and all these Greek myths uh, from which uh, the entire white civilization, uh, so to speak, sort of emanated or blossomed is something which is referred to over here. And interestingly, that Greek, uh, that, that the entire Greek uh, you know, origin space, so the genesis space, uh, is obviously in some kind of a conflict with the Christian idea of origin, the Christian idea of the original story narrative. And so they are obviously undercutting each other in that sense. Uh, will he come, the Jesuit Jesuit, seizing and began to shave with care. Tell me, Mulligan, Stephen said quietly, yes, my love, how long is Hines going to stay in this tower? Buck Mulligan showed um, a, a shaven cheek uh, over his right shoulder. God, isn't it dreadful, he said frankly, a ponderous Saxon. He thinks you're not a gentleman. God is bloody English, bursting with money and indigestion because it comes from Oxford, you know. Dallas, you have the real Oxford manner. He can't make you out. Hey, my name for you is the best, kin to the knife blade. He shaved warily over his chin. So we have something similar to what we saw uh, in the, uh, at the end of the short story, Araby. If you remember the story, Araby, which we did uh, earlier, we had this whole idea of the English versus the, uh, the Irish uh, tension. And that tension gets manifested in terms of language, in terms of accent, in terms of the manner of speaking, in terms of the choice of words, etc. So Haynes over here is an Englishman who is supposedly in some kind of a tense relationship with, uh, you know, Stephen Dallas over here. Okay, uh, and so this whole conversation about, um, you know, Dallas and Haynes goes on. Uh, and now um, the whole idea of the... Uh, the, the dead mother comes up and the dead mother becomes a very conspicuous absence in the novel. So Didalis uh, obviously comes from a you know, family of deadness, there's no, uh, no one alive away uh, in terms of his parents and so uh, he becomes very quickly appropriated or appropriable by someone like Leopold Bloom and, um, and Molly Bloom who are you know, childless. So they become the surrogate parents, so to speak, the spiritual parents uh, or the narrative parents, uh, so to speak, uh, of Didalis in this particular novel. Okay. Uh, now the mother figure becomes interesting because originally the mother figure comes in as a sea figure. So the amniotic quality of the sea uh, is obviously extended into the mother figure, the, the protector, nurturer figure. Uh, that very quickly comes into the biological mother of Didalis, who has long since been dead. And the dead mother comes in as a very conspicuous presence in a novel. She keeps coming up as a metaphor of guilt, as a metaphor of uh, you know, uh, unrequited love, as a metaphor of uh, you know, uh, you know, filial ingratitude, a filial lack of duty. Uh, so that becomes an interesting point. That becomes almost a traumatic uh, point for Stephen D. Dallas, the fact that he did not do something he ought to have done as a son. Okay, right. Uh, the aunt thinks you killed your mother, he said. That's why she won't let me have anything to do with you. Someone killed her, Stephen said gloomily. You could have knelt down, damn it, Kinch, when a dying mother asks you. Buck Mulligan said, I'm hyperborean as much as you, but I think of your mother begging you with a last breath to kneel down and pray for her, and he refused. There is something sinister in you. So that we get this backstory now. The Didelis, uh, or Stephen, over here, she's, he suffers from his continual guilt, his continual pang of uh, remorse and repentance because he had not prayed for her mother, his mother, uh, on her deathbed when he implored her, when she implored him to do it, when she begged him to do it on her deathbed, he refused to do it. And this refusal obviously becomes something of a permanent guilt, a permanent marker of guilt and trauma in his mind. Okay. Uh, Stephen and Elbow uh, rested on a jagged granite, leaned his palm against the brow and gazed at the, at the fraying edge of the shiny uh, black cord sleeve. A pain that was not yet the pain of love fretted his heart. Silently, in a dream, she had come to him after her dead. So the posthumous appearance of the mother becomes important. It's a symbolic reminder of Stephen's uh, recursive guilt. Uh, so uh, she keeps coming back in his dreams as a ghostly spectral character who has obviously long since been dead. Uh, and that obviously uh, informs his guilt and trauma even more. So she makes, uh, keeps making appearances in her dream. Uh, silently, in a dream, she had come to him after her death. 
her wasted body within its loose brown grave clothes, giving up an odor of wax and rosewood, uh, her breath that had been bent upon him, mute, reproachful, a faint odor of wetted ashes. Across a treadbare cuff edge, he saw the sea hailed as a great sweet mother by the well-fed uh, well voice beside him. So you have different kinds of uh, mother figures over here. The sea is described as a mother figure, something that's nourishing uh, humankind with its amniotic quality, with its endless amniotic quality, the endlessness of love, the endlessness of the sea's resources, obviously uh, in equation with the endlessness of mother's love. Uh, and compared to, uh, in, in, Comparison to that, we have the real mother who was um, you know, unrequited in her love. She would not return his, uh, you know, her love to her uh, and let her die, uh, being unrequited. Uh, someone you know, who wanted him to do something, requested him to do something, and he failed to do it, he refused to do it. So in his refusal, he had failed to be the good son. So as he becomes a macro, a spectacular example of the mother figure to him, which in turn reminds him of his guilt, reminds him of his trauma, of his remorse of not having paid heed to his mother's uh, request, the dying request of uh, praying for her on her deathbed. Okay, the ring of bay and skyline held a dull green mass of liquid. The bowl of white china, a bowl of white china had stood beside her deathbed, holding the green sluggish bile which she had torn off from her rotting liver by fits of loud groaning, vomiting. So you find again very bodily functions, sickly functions, the sick body, the diseased body is foregrounded over here. Uh, the body of the dying mother is the first real body to appear in Ulysses. And how does it appear? A bowl of white chinam had stood beside her dead bed, holding this green sluggish bile which she had torn up from a rotting liver by fits of gro loud groaning, vomiting. So the greenness, the greenness of, the, of the bile and the greenness of the sea uh, are obviously uh, coming together in Stephen's imagination. So you see the massive sea who is described as a mother figure and who is obviously, which is obviously green in color, green in quality, is when equated with the, uh, the green bile that his mother had coughed up uh, you know, in a dead bed. And that obviously you know, is something which keeps coming up in his dreams. Okay, so um, right, and then uh, there's an interesting uh, section later where uh, Stephen um, talks about uh, ox uh, uh, buck milling in a certain question about his dead mother. Before that is a little symbol which I want to spend a little bit of time with. Uh, you know, the, the broken meta symbol. The broken meta becomes a very interesting uh, symbol in Ulysses and Stephen explains to the street, uh, you know, buck milling and saying the broken mirror is a symbol of Irish art. Uh, but that obviously takes up different political connotations as well. Uh, so Stephen bent forward and peered at a mirror held out to him, cleft by a crooked crack hair on end, as he um, and others see me. Who chose this face for me? This dog's body, the rid of, to rid of vermin, it asked me too. Uh, I pinched out of the skiffy's room. Buck Mulligan said, it does her all night, all right. The aunt always keeps plain looking servants for Malachi. Lead him, not into temptation. And her name is Ursula. Laughing again, he brought the mirror away from Stephen's peering eyes, a broken mirror. Some, there's a crack in the mirror. The rage of Caliban at not seeing his face in a mirror, he said, if Wilde were only alive to see you. So the reference to Wilde becomes interesting because Wilde obviously is a, a metaphor, uh, an archetype to a certain extent of the Irish artist, the Irish wordsmith or the Irish craftsman in, in literature. Uh, so that is a, a figure that uh, you know, Stephen obviously aspires to reach, aspires to appropriate. Uh, drawing back and pointing, Stephen said with bitterness, it's a symbol of Irish art, the cracked looking glass of a servant. Buck Mulligan suddenly linked his arm in Stevenson's and walked with him around the tower, there his razor and mirror clacking in the pocket where he had trust them. It's not fair to tease you like that, Ken, she said. He said kindly, God knows he, 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 he had more spirit than any of them. Buried again. He fears the lancet of my art as I fear that of his, the cold steel pen. Okay, so there's almost like a battle going on and the battle, uh, no, no, some kind of a uh, tension between um, Buck Mulligan and Stephen and the question that comes in Stephen's mind uh, will be uh, quite interestingly uh, articulated. Okay, So again the whole idea of um, Stephen's mother comes up, the dead mother. And the section is interesting where Stephen asks um, uh, the question to Buck Mulligan. And remember when he first introduced me to your family, how did he introduce me as? And this section uh, and it requires it deserves a bit of a uh, detailed description. Okay, uh, and this is a question that uh, Stephen asks Buck Mulligan. Do you remember the first day when I went to your house after my mother's death? Buck Mulligan frowned quickly and said, uh, what, where, I can't remember anything. I remember only ideas and sensations. Why? What happened in the name of God? 
You are making teas, Jimin said, and went across the landing to get some more hot water. Your mother and some visitor came out of the drawing room. She asked you who was in the room. Yes, Buck Mulligan said, what did I say? I forget. You said, Stephen answered, oh, it's only the Dallas whose mother is beastly dead. Right? So again, the whole idea of the mother being beastly dead becomes interesting. And the word beastly, of course, is used in a very English sense, a very uh, upper class English sense. But it, it does it takes up different connotations over here. Uh, the beastliness of this is the as part of the loneliness. She doesn't really get get any. She didn't really get any human empathy. She didn't really get any human, um, you know, prayer, any human touch, any human companionship uh, during her death. So in that sense, it's also beastly. In that, is that, in that sense, it's also uh, quite terribly lonely in quality. So you said, Stephen answered, oh, it's only jealous whose mother is beastly dead. A flush which made him seem younger and more engaging rose to Buck Mulligan's cheek. Did I say that? He asked. Well, what harm is that? He shook his constraint from him nervously. And what is dead? He asked. Your mother is not yours or my own. You saw your mother. You saw only your mother die. And this is a medical section over here, which I mentioned a while ago. How did that, how Buck Mulligan looks at the whole experience of death, the whole image of death, the whole body of death is from a medical gaze which has nothing to do with the metaphysical understanding of death at all. So we have this interesting uh, dialogue going on, so to speak, between the medical and the metaphysical views on the experience of death. So you only saw, you saw only a mother die. I see them pop up every day in the Meta enrichment uh, as a place where he works uh, as an apprentice, as a, as a medical student, and cut up into tribes uh, in the dissecting room. It's a beastly thing and nothing else. It simply doesn't matter. So again, the word beastly comes back away uh, uh, in a different connotation this time. So you say, you know, it's a beastly thing, uh, you know, it's something which is, uh, it's nothing to do with any human companionship or human quality, it's just a body. It's just a caterpillar uh, which is cut up in a dissecting room. And we do it all the time as doctors. We're trained to cut dead bodies. We're trained to look at death from a very different perspective, not from a perspective of some metaphysical understanding of mortality, not that at all, but as a very earthly uh, and a bodily phenomenon, as a phenomenon of functionality or dysfunctionality. Okay, the body becoming dysfunctional is what we are interested in uh, as doctors. Okay, uh, it simply doesn't matter. You wouldn't kneel down to pray for your mother on a deathbed when he asks you. Why? Because you have the cursed Jesuit strain in you, only it's injected in a wrong way. To me, it's all a mockery and beastly, the you know, what comes back again. Her cerebral lobes are not functioning. She calls the doctor, uh, Sir Peter Teasel, and picks uh, buttercups off her quilt. Humor her till it's over. You cross the last wish in dead. And you have to sulk with me because I wouldn't whinge. I don't whinge like some hired mute from Laludus. Absurd. I suppose I did say it. I didn't mean to offend the memory of her mother. So, you know, we find that uh, Buck Mulligan gets uh, quite defensive over here. And he tells uh, Stephen that, you know, this is a, a hypocrisy of the highest order. This is rich coming from you because you wouldn't even uh, humor her, your mother on her deathbed. You wouldn't even uh, pay heed to her final, uh, final request for praise. And yet you are judging me for saying a word, uh, for saying an expression which you think uh, was in poor taste. Uh, and then, of course, he apologizes. I didn't mean to offend the memory of your mother. He, he had spoken himself into boldness. Stephen, shielding the gaping wounds which the words had left in his heart, said very coldly, I'm not thinking about the offence to my mother. Oh, of what then? Buck Mulligan asked. Of the offence to me? Stephen answered. Buck Mulligan swung round on his heel. Oh, an impossible person, he exclaimed. He walked off quickly around the parapet. Stephen stood at his pose, gazing over the calm sea towards the, whole, the headland. Sea and headland now grew dim. Pulses were beating on his eyes, veiling the side, and he felt the fever of his cheeks. So again, look at the way in which feverishness of the whole experience of having a fever comes back. Again, a bodily function uh, which, uh, which informs an, an, an epiphany experience. So we have an epiphany over here. It's quite embodied in quality. A voice within a tower called loudly, Are you up there, Mulligan? Uh, I'm coming, Buck Mulligan answered. He turned towards Stephen and said, uh, Look at the sea. Why does it care about offences? Chuck Loyola, Kinch, and come on down. Uh, the Sassanach warns us morning rashes. So again, the sea is used as a metaphor over here, something which is uh, beyond <coughs> any human uh, offence, any human insult, any human injury. Uh, that's used again as a metaphor for, you know, uh, as, as like a massive leveller, so to speak. His head halted again for a moment at the top of the staircase, level with the roof. Don't mope over it all day, he said. I'm inconsequent. Give up. 
the moody brooding. So again, this brooding image is something which Stephen is associated with throughout this particular novel. And you know, uh, we find uh, two different kinds of knowledge others are in uh, dialogue with each other. So Stephen is obviously more metaphysical, more literary, more metaphoric, more imaginative. Whereas Buck Mulligan is something where someone is quoting Latin all the time, but his grasp in reality is far more material in qualities. And because he's a medical practitioner and his uh, experience in medicine, his treatment in medicine, his training in medicine. Uh, makes them more earthly, more uh, material driven compared to Stephen's more metaphysical insights into life, death and the whole process of the whole experience of living. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> and now again uh, the, the question of uh, the, the dead mother comes up uh, in Stephen's imagination and uh, some kind of a uh, memory markup. Uh, folded away in the memory of nature with her toys, memories beset his brooding brain. A glass of water from the kitchen tap when she had approached the sacrament, a cold apple filled with brown sugar, roasting for her at the, at the hob of a dark autumn evening, her shapely fingernails reddened by the blood of scratched lice from the children's uh, shirts. In a dream silently she had come to him, her wasted body within its loose uh, grave clothes giving up an odor of wax and rosewood. Uh, out of breath, bent over him with mute secret words, a faint odor of wetted ashes. Her glazing eyes, staring out of death, to shake and bend my soul, on me alone, the coarse candle to light her agony, coarsely light on a tortured face, a host round, host loud uh, a breath, rattling in horror, while all prayed on the knees, her eyes on me to strike me down. So there's something very spectral about this. Uh, uh, almost like a retribution like quality about for not having prayed for the dead mother. The dead, the dead mother keeps coming back, not as a nourishing figure, but as a traumatizing figure for Stephen, for Stephen to Dallas. Uh, okay. Goal, chewer of copses. So the mother becomes goal. It's like an evil spirit of a curse, a chewer of copses. Uh, no mother, let me be and let me live. Kin to hoy. Buck Mulligan's voice sang from within the tower. It came nearer up the staircase, calling again. Stephen, still trembling at the soul's cry, heard warm running sunlight and in the air behind him friendly words. So again, uh, it's like a reverie which is broken and the reverie is inhabited by the dead mother coming back in a ghostly, coldish quality, spectral quality, almost uh, uh, trying to avenge uh, um, the lack of prayers or the prayerlessness. Uh, on her deathbed. So she's coming back over and over again as uh, Stephen's imagination, you know, in that kind of a belief system where the dead does not find salvation or the soul does not find peace unless prayed uh, by the living around them, living companions around them on the deathbed. Okay, so. Uh, <clears throat> So again, the whole idea of uh, the Cockney accent becomes interesting because we talked about how, uh, you know, if you remember um, the, the, the end of Arabi, the short story where the boy goes to the fair, Arabi, the bazaar Arabi, and he finds uh, a couple of men flirting with a woman and, you know, uh, and he observed their English accents. And the English accent obviously is very different from the Irish accent. And so we have uh, uh, and Buck Mulligan singing a song. He flung up his hands and tramped down uh, on the st stone stairs, singing out of tune with a cockney accent. Oh, won't we have a merry time drinking whiskey, beer, and wine on Coronation, Coronation Day? Oh, won't we have a merry time on Coronation Day? So, again, Coronation obviously is a royal ritual, uh, but uh, oh yeah, it also becomes a symbolic ritual. So, Stephen uh, is obviously. Uh, the, the artist to be over here and this degree of coronation are waiting for him. And this particular uh, nonsense sing song rhyme that uh, Buck Mulligan uh, sings at this point of time takes up different significance subsequently. Okay. Uh, I look at the materials, the material objects around uh, this particular landscape now. Warm sunshine marrying over the sea, the nickel shaving bowl shone forgotten on the parapet. Why should uh, I break it down or leave it there all day, forgotten friendship? He went over to it, held it in his hands a while, feeling its coolness, smelling the clammy slaver of the leather in which the brush was struck. Stuck. So carry the boat of incense then as uh, clung ways. I'm another now and yet the same. A servant to a server of the servant. So again, uh, it's very, very um, synesthetic in quality as you can see. The synesthesia is that uh, you know, state of being where one particular sense triggers another sense and the two senses merge together. Like for instance, if you have a sense of smell, uh, that can remind you of a sense of sight and the two senses can merge together in some synesthetic combination. Okay. Now, the figure of the uh, milk woman becomes interesting as well. Uh, the milk woman is someone who comes in to deliver the milk uh, to these three men in the morning and she almost has a quasi 
mythical quality, some kind of a messenger like quality uh, by delivering the milk. The doorway was darkened by an entering form. The milk sir, come on, ma'am. Uh, Mulligan said, Kinch, get the jug. An old woman came forward and stu stood by Stevenson's elbow. That's a lovely morning, sir, she said. Glory be to God. To whom? Mulligan said, glancing at her. Out, oh, to be sure. Stephen reached back and took the milk jug from the locker. The islanders, Mulligan said to Haynes casually, speak frequently of the collector of uh, prepuces. How much, sir? asked the old woman. A quart, a quarter, as a measurement for milk, Stephen said. He watched her pour into the, into the measure and thence into the thick, the jug of rich white milk, not hers. All shrunken pups. She poured again a, a measure full of an, an a tilly. All in secret, she had entered from a morning world. Maybe a messenger, so the word messenger actually arrives. So it's some kind of a mythical messenger like quality about this woman. Maybe a messenger. Uh, she praised the goodness of the milk, pouring it out, crouching by a patient cow at daybreak in the lush field, a witch on a toadstool, her wrinkled fingers quick at the squirting ducks. This, they load about, uh, uh, load about her whom they knew, uh, dew silky cattle, silk of the kind and the poor old woman, uh, names given her in old times, a wandering crayon, lowly form of an immortal serving, her conqueror and a gay betrayer, the common uh, cock queen a messenger from the secret morning, to serve or to be upbraid or to upbraid, uh, whether he could not tell, but scorned to beg a favor. So, you know, she appears like a messenger-like quality of Stephen's imagination. And, you know, there are certain sections in Ulysses where uh, it almost takes some a mythical uh, ambient quality, and ambient quality almost becomes mythical in quality of extension. So this is one of those figures, uh, uh, the one woman that comes in, this very shrunken old woman, who comes in to deliver milk, and the, the countenance of this woman should remind us of the very shrunken appearance of Tiresias, uh, you know, who appeared in uh, Ulysses, uh, in, in, in uh, T.S. Eliot's Wasteland, as some kind of a shrunken figure, uh, who nevertheless sees everything, knows everything, is a messenger from some other world. Okay, uh, and you know this is a question. Um, you know, and uh, the woman asks Buck Milligan uh, the medical quality, the medical knowledge of Buck Milligan is foreground over here. Well, she asks him a question: Are you a medical student, sir? The old woman asks: I am, ma'am. Buck Milligan answered: Look at that now. She said. Stephen listened in a scornful silence. Uh, she bows her old head to a voice that speaks to her uh, loudly. Her bones set up. Her medicine man, me, she slides to the voice that will shrive in oil for the grave all uh, th that there is for her. But her woman's unclean loins, a man's flesh made not in God's likeness, but the serpent's prey. And to that loud voice, what now bids her to be silent with wandering, unsteady eyes? Uh, do you understand what he says? Stephen asked her. Uh, is it French you're talking, sir? The old woman said to Haynes. Haynes spoke to her again in a longer speech, co confidently. Irish, Buck Mulligan said. Is it Gaelic on you? I thought it was Irish, she said, by the sound of it. Are you from the West, sir? I'm an Englishman, Haynes answered. He's English, Buck Mulligan said, and he thinks we ought to speak Irish in Ireland. Now, <coughs> this becomes a very important uh, question, a language question, and this. Uh, and this, these are certain sections in Ulysses where, which makes it actually very interesting in post-colonial equality. So I'll just read this and I'll end with this and we'll unpack this a bit. Sure we ought to do, the old woman said, and I'm ashamed I don't speak the language myself. I'm told it's a grand language for them, the nose. Grand is no name for it, said Bob Milligan, wonderful entirely. Fill us some more tea, Kinch. We'd like a cup, ma'am. No, thank you, sir, the old woman said, slipping the ring of the milk can on the forearm and about to go. Haynes said to her, have you your bill? We'd better pay her, Milligan, hadn't we? Stephen filled her with three cups. Bill, sir, she said, holding. Well, it's seven mornings, a pint, a two pence, and seven twos, a shilling, and two pence over, and a three mornings, and a quart, and four pence, is three, three quarts, and is a shilling. That's a shilling, and one or two is two and two, sir. So she does this very complicated calculation at the time of billing. But, you know, just before that, the whole idea of the um, language uh, politics becomes interesting because, you know, the Englishman thinks that uh, the Irish should speak, uh, you know, Irish in England, in, in, in Ireland. Uh, and that's obviously a very, uh, a very you know, naive assumption on the part of the Englishman who actually was a colonizer. And the Irishman, of course, is speaking in, Irish, in English, but in a very intoned English, you know, with an accent, which is not, definitely not the British accent. Uh, and that obviously uh, irritates the Englishman. So the Englishman over the Haynes over here is a troublemaker. Haynes over here is a person who doesn't quite fit in. He's an uh, incongruous, incompatible presence over here. And he's saying to those Irish people that because you're Irish, uh, you, know, you ought to speak in uh, Irish, uh, Irish, the pure, pure language. Uh, the old woman over here agrees sentimentally with Haynes' suggestion, but she says that that's a, you know, 
that's a language which you don't speak anymore. It's a grand language. So, you know, that assumption on the part of the colonizer that the colonized should speak their own language and not English, it obviously becomes a very problematic assumption because that becomes, uh, that also uh, translates into a question of ownership on language. He owns the language. So, English becomes the language of the British only and Irish ought to speak Irish, uh, so to speak. So, any idea of appropriation becomes problematic from the colonizer's perspective. So, the colonizer doesn't quite like that a colonized subject speak in English, which happens to be the original tongue. Now, this of course is a very complicated and very long drawn out political uh, debate to be had. But suffice it to say that the whole novel Ulysses is written in English, of course, uh, and it's written in a kind of English which decimates or deconstructs uh, the grand narrative about English writing and the novel English, the English writing which informs the novel. Uh, that becomes decimated, that becomes deconstructed in the very act of uh, writing Ulysses. So, you know, so this language question becomes very much part of the post colonial debate over here. Okay, and then of course uh, she makes this complicated calculation as a shilling and one or two is two and two, sir. Uh, Buck Mulligan sighed and having filled his mouth with a crust thickly buttered on both sides, stretched forth his legs and began to search his trouser pocket. So again, uh, this becomes, uh, those of you uh, who are uh, Joyce fans, who are Ulysses fans, who know, uh, you know, there are a lot of questions, quiz questions about Ulysses and there's some trivia about Ulysses. And one question which keeps, uh, keeps getting asked all the time is that when Buck Mulligan was having his bread, which side uh, did he butter? And the correct answer would be both sides, thickly buttered on both sides. Um, so stretch for his legs and began to search his trouser pockets. Pay up and look pleasant, uh, Haynes said to him, smiling. Stephen filled a third cup, a spoonful of tea colouring faintly the thick rich milk. Buck Mulligan brought up a florin, twisted it around his fingers and cried a miracle. He passed it along the table towards the old woman, saying, Ask nothing or more of me, sweet, all I can give you I give. Stephen laid the coin in an uneager hand. We'll owe two pence, um, uh, he said. Time enough, sir, he said, taking the coin. Time enough. Good morning, sir. She curtsied and went out, followed by Buck Mulligan's tender chant. How to my heart, where it were, uh, more would be laid at your feet. Okay, so uh, uh, this episode becomes interesting, and I'll end at this point today. Uh, the arrival of the milk woman as some kind of a mythical messenger who comes in to deliver milk. Uh, and a small conversation which also becomes quite political in quality. So she is both mythical as well as political in quality. So she's someone who appears in terms of appearance as a mythical messenger, but her uh, uh, entire uh, dialogue about language, about the, the Irish language and the English language becomes uh, you know, quite political in quality. And of course, uh, the whole idea of owing money to the messenger uh, becomes uh, sort of quasi mythical again. And she departs, the departure is quite cryptic in quality. She comes, delivers milk milk go, goes away quite quickly and the three students away uh, have this very interesting conversation with her which makes the entire episode quasi-mythic in quality as well as being quite political in quality. So I'll stop at this point today but I hope to have established by now that Ulysses is a novel which draws on a mythical frame, the mythical method but actually deals with the very earthly now, the earthly reality of Dublin uh, in which it is very stubbornly situated. Right? And the stubborn situatedness of Ulysses is something which we must never lose sight of because you know it, it, it actually becomes a very coarse, filthy, uh, earthly novel and the filthy quality, the earthly quality, the scatological quality of Ulysses is part of the, uh, the is part of the complexity, is part of the narrative complexity, is part of the scandal, so to speak, uh, which makes it uh, you know such a such a scandal in, in English imagination and the entire uh, not just in a mortal map of uh, uh, England and Ireland, but also in the linguistic map of England and Ireland. Because if you remember uh, the lecture before this, prior to this, when I started off with this background of the novel, I said that this was bound on two counts. One, of course, was obscenity, uh, a foreground of the body, the sexuality of the body, the, the defecation quality of the body. I mean, the different kinds of functionality of the body was foregrounded. Uh, and there's nothing concealed. The body was very much part of the narrative process. And also the second uh, count uh, due to which it got banned, uh, the scandal arose, was due to obscurity. It was written in a language which is not really English in that sense. So it was a rewriting of the English language. Uh, it was a deconstruction of the English language, which became part of the scandal. So this episode which we stopped at today, uh, you know, it sort of throws light on some of the bigger concerns, Ulysses, which we'll take up in the times to come. So I'll stop at this point today. I'll continue with the lecture of this particular text and the coming lectures. Thank you for your attention.